studies on introduction to the apocalypse. Thank you, Jim. Good evening, brethren, sisters and young people. This is the first of a new series of studies which we're going to be undertaking, God willing, uh, for, I guess, whatever time it takes until the coming of the Lord, hopefully, and we hope that will be soon. I want to just speak briefly at the outset of this series of studies of the reasons for it and to talk about some of the uh, mechanical administrative matters as well. The purpose of the class, I think, is fairly obvious. There is no book in the scriptures designed better for the times in which we live than the book which we call Revelation, the Apocalypse. It was designed for the servants of God that they might be prepared for the return of his son. In whatever era they lived, they would see the hand of their God at work in the affairs of nations and of organisations and they would know where they were. And of course we know from reading history that there have been many people down through the ages, even in the dark ages, who had some inkling of where they were in the purpose of God because they had at least a little appreciation of the content of the apocalypse. We live right at the end of the days. We believe we will be the generation that sees the Lord return. And therefore, brethren and sisters and young people, on his advice, it is wise for us to understand the apocalypse. We want to talk a bit more about that in a moment. There's another reason, of course, why we want to tackle this book, and that is because we do have a large number of young people in this meeting, and we are extremely thankful to our God for that fact. We are grateful that we've been given the responsibility for our young people. And we know that part of our responsibility as an ecclesia is to make sure that our young people are brought into an understanding of the apocalypse, even while they are young, so that when they grow up, become adults and have their own children, they will have an appreciation of the content of this book and know and understand by their own personal attention to it its importance in the scheme of things. So we don't make any bones about it, that what we're going to be doing, hopefully, as time goes on, is endeavouring to increase the knowledge of those who are younger and less experienced among us. I know that there are many in this hall tonight who are very well aware of the content of the apocalypse and who have been students of it and of the writings of our pioneers for a long time. Though, of course, you will also receive some benefit, as I will, and others who will be involved in the leadership of this class, it is to our young that, we, that there will be a particular focus. Now, just in relation to the administrative matters, most of you should have received, when you came in the hall tonight, a copy of this uh, set of notes, the folder, in which there are four or five pages. I want to talk a bit about that. We are serious about this, uh, brethren, sisters and young people, and this is just one small thing that we are attempting to do to allow you to store the notes that are handed out at this class. And there will be Bible marking notes issued on a regular basis, God willing, as we go on. What you've got in that folder at the moment is a series of pages which have to do with the introduction of the book and we'll be talking about these things tonight and if necessary next uh, time around. What I would ask you to do is... Each time you are given some notes, and I guess it would be useful if you brought your folder with you on each evening, but even if you fail to do that, each time you're given some notes at this class, either at the class or when you get home, just to pop them in the, in the, uh, in the folder, in their right order, so that you've got this uh, progression of notes as we go on. And those of you who can actually dig out the notes that were issued on Revelation 17 to 22 for the class that was done several months ago, might like to put them in the last uh, leaves uh, of this uh, folder so that they are preserved as well. 
Now, the, the intention of this, of course, is fairly obvious, I think, to most of you. I guess you're a little bit like me, that when notes are given out, you say, oh, that's interesting, I, I like notes being given out at classes and so on because they're helpful. I pop them in a file, usually, and I put them in a cupboard and sometimes it's 10 or 15 years later I discover I've got them. And they haven't been a great deal of use to me. What we would like to do in this class is to encourage you, particularly our younger people, if you have not marked up the apocalypse, here is a golden opportunity for you to do that. We did this a long time ago with the young people and I know that there are some here who look back upon that opportunity that they had with a lot of gratitude. I certainly am one of them because I wouldn't know as much about this book had I not had the opportunity to mark it in my margin. My memory is failing as years go by and I often have cause to read the scriptures from a Bible other than this Bible I'm using here tonight. And when I read the Apocalypse without markings in my margin, I know how hard it is to really comprehend what it's saying because I haven't got any markings in front of me on that particular occasion. But when I use this Bible in which there is marking, then I can tell you what each phrase, what each passage means. And I think that's a very valuable thing, particularly if you happen to be involved in reading the scriptures with others. So we, we are going to be encouraging you to take the opportunity. Now, there'll be a class every month, which means you've got four weeks to mark up and try and keep pace with the studies. We won't be going at such a reckless pace that you won't have opportunity to, to do it. So that's why we've given you the folder. Now, at this stage, we've given one per couple. If you're in a situation like mine, your wife will want her own folder. Now, I'm quite happy. There are some additional copies of the notes out here. You can do one of two things. You can take some copies of the notes and buy your own folder. They're not all that dear. Uh, but um, if you don't want to do that, we can make one available to you at cost. I want to try and spread this around as much as we can, but I think you'll appreciate that if we gave a folder to everyone, cost would be uh, fairly substantial. We've certainly given a folder to each of our young people that we think will be able to follow this study. For those of you who are visiting, you've got a folder and you've got no further use for it, well, we don't mind you taking it with you, but it might be perhaps uh, better, if you're not going to be using it in future, uh, to leave it uh, with, um, in the box at the entrance to the hall and someone else can use it in due time. You're certainly welcome to take the sheets of notes with you if you desire. We certainly also welcome the fact that there are people here from other than our own ecclesia and you're certainly invited to make use of this opportunity with us. So enough about administrative matters. Why study the apocalypse? Well, as far as we are aware, there are only two books in the scripture that Christ commended to be studied with some intensity. Now, of course, he was a student of the entire Old Testament. He was the word made flesh. He knew the Bible backwards. He could find sections of Isaiah in a scroll which didn't have chapter divisions, didn't have any verses listed. It was just a scroll with writing. He could find what we call Isaiah 61 and he could quote that. So he was a student of the scriptures par excellence. But we only know of two books that he said should be understood, read and understood. He, he particularly directed the attention of his servants to those two books. Now, one of them was the book of Daniel. Have a look at Matthew ch chapter 24. In Matthew 24... And at verse 15, he said to his disciples, on this occasion just four of them, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. So he uses this phrase, let him understand. Understand. It was critical to their future 
and to their well-being to understand what Daniel had spoken about the emergence of what he calls here the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel in chapter 9. So he wanted his disciples to take the book of Daniel, to read it and to understand it, that it might have an impact upon their lives and that they might be ready for the events that were going to overtake that generation. And it's precisely the same for you and me because the other book that he specifically directs our attention to, that it might be understood, is the apocalypse itself. So come to Revelation chapter 1. It begins, this book, with the phrase, the revelation of Jesus Christ. The word revelation, as our brother Neville has indicated in his prayer, is the word apocalypsis, from whence we have the English version, apocalypse, which means to uncover or to unveil, to bring to light that which was hidden, to reveal something, hence revelation. So this book is about revealing something. And it's not about revealing something to everyone. It was given specifically to his servants. Notice verse 1, which God, I want you to notice the, the order here, as again Brother Neville mentioned, the order is quite clear. Which God gave unto him, Jesus Christ, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Now you can just get in your minds if you can, this, this scene, that when the Lord Jesus Christ arrived in heaven, a lot of things would have happened. But one of the things that, that eventually happened was that his father turned to him, who's sitting on his right hand, turned to him and said, listen, my son, the time has come for me to give to you the apocalypse concerning what I am doing with you and through you and you will then in turn give that to your servants. I mean, when you think about that, that's quite awesome that God himself would take that step to reveal certain things unto his servants which, he says, must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel under his servant John. We'll talk more about the signifying of it a little later. And then we come down to verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Now there are certain words used here which we want to pursue a little tonight. The first one is that word, blessed. It is the Greek word makarios and it has as an, its, its essential idea continual happiness. In fact, you find that word used in John chapter 13 and verse 17 where Christ says to his disciples, happy are ye if you do them, that is my commandments. Happy are you if you do them. And the idea of that word to do there is to do continually. So that perhaps implies that the happiness is also a continual happiness because the actions are continuous. So Makarios has this idea of having a happiness that persists. Blessed is he that readeth. This idea of reading in the Greek anaginosko means to know accurately. Increasing knowledge is of course a constant necessity in the truth. And to know accurately is very important. He says, and they that hear, the word there, of course, obviously has the idea of hearing, but not merely just hearing words. It's actually talking about implementing the words, giving sufficient heed to the words that they become part of your life. And then he says, and keep those things which are written therein. To keep is to watch over and to preserve them to keep strictly. Brother Thomas translates them, observe narrowly. So then, what he's saying in this passage 
is very important to us in the introduction of this study because it's telling us a number of things. It's telling us that our Lord Jesus Christ wants us to understand this book. It's also telling us that the book can be understood. It's not a closed book or should not be a closed book. But it's also telling us that it was to be understood by a certain class of people who are described as his servants. It was not a book designed, in fact, on the contrary, it was a book designed to cover for some and to reveal for others. There would be some who would never understand it because it didn't have the keys to understand it. But there would be others to whom it would be revealed. But it can be understood. Of course, it's, it would be nonsense, wouldn't it? For him to give a book and to say, oh, I want this book to be understood if you couldn't understand it. It would also be nonsense to say, I want you to keep the sayings of this book, which means I want it to affect and impact your life if you couldn't understand what he was saying. So consequently, it can be understood. We want to encourage particularly our younger people that that is a fact. Providing you've got the keys, you can understand this book, even though it does seem difficult when you first start out. And I can testify to that from some 35 years or so ago. So there we've got those two passages, Matthew 24 and Revelation 1 verse 3, in which the Lord Jesus Christ particularly focuses the attention of his servants upon the book of Daniel and on the apocalypse. Now why should that be the case? Well, we don't have to go far for an answer. The answer lies in the fact that this book, the apocalypse, carries with it in its understanding and in the keeping of its sayings an inherent blessing. Now you will have some notes somewhere in your folder on this particular transparency. It may be, need a magnifying glass to read it, but it's there. The Blessings of the Apocalypse. Now this book, the Apocalypse, we are going to find in our studies is a book of sevens. It is full of sevens, as you perhaps are fully aware. There are seven letters to the Ecclesias in chapters 2 and 3. When you get to chapter 6, there are seven seals. When you get to chapters 8 and 9, there are seven trumpets. When you get to chapter 10, there is mention of seven thunders. When you get to chapter 16, there are seven vials. And so on it goes. The number of, of cycles of seven are quite amazing in this book. Why should that be the case? Well, seven, quite apart from being the number which stands for fullness or completion, completion of a cycle, quite apart from being the biblical number which refers to covenant, is also, as Brother Thomas points out in Eureka, the number of the Spirit. That's why you read in Revelation chapter 4 of the seven spirits of God before the throne. It's not that there are seven spirits. There's only one spirit. But they're described as seven spirits because that is the number of the spirit. That's why our Bible is undergirded by the number seven from Genesis 1 verse 1 to Revelation 22. It's undergirded. Both Hebrew and Greek have the letters of the, of the alphabet have numerical values. And there is a certain structure which undergirds the whole Bible. And the number seven, amongst others, dominates that undergirding. Why should that be so? Because it's the product of the Spirit. So here is a book which has been delivered by the eternal Spirit himself through the manifestation of himself, his Son, by the power of the Spirit working on John the Apostle. And everywhere you go in this book, it breathes the Spirit. And this is just one case. 
the blessings of the apocalypse. The number seven, and there are seven of them. Now you can see them listed there. I guess the two that I wanted to highlight were the first one and the last one, or sorry, the sixth one. The last one is very much akin to it. But in Revelation 22, we might just turn to that, in Revelation 22, because we've looked at chapter 1, verse 3. In the last chapter of the book, as the Lord delivers his last message, he is keen to emphasise this matter of the blessing. Verse 7 of Revelation 22. He says, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Now this word keepeth, we've met before, terio. It means to watch over, to preserve, to keep, to guard from loss. Now he's not just talking about guarding the, the apocalypse from tampering or from misinterpretation. That's involved. He's actually talking about keeping this book in terms of our behaviour. Preserving it in terms of its impact upon our life. And I'll tell you something. It's a simple fact of history that when people make the effort to understand the apocalypse, it invariably affects the way they live their lives. Let me just give you one example from my own experience. Because I'm forced to travel to work by train, rather than just sit there and look out the window, which I find very difficult to do, I read. I don't find reading newspapers very edifying. So I don't read newspapers. I read, when I can, the works of the truth. I have had the privilege of working through Eureka several times. I've picked up other books and read them. But I'll tell you something. I have noticed that when I have been reading through Eureka, because my mind is forced to be at a different level, it has a direct impact upon my life. I've detected that. And when, for whatever reason, I'm not reading through Eureka, I notice the difference. Now, that's something that's happened to me over the last 15 or 20 years. So I understand exactly what the Lord meant. If your mind is in this book, if you are endeavouring to understand it and to raise the level of your thinking to the spirit level, then you will be impacted by it. It will have an effect upon your life. You will find it perhaps a little easier to deal with the problems of the flesh and of the evils of this world which are obviously increasing so rapidly that we, are, we must be, we just must be near the end. And it's time, I think, for us to take radical steps to make sure that we defend ourselves against the, in, in, the incursions of this evil world. And this is one way of doing it. Turn your mind to the apocalypse. In the, the seventh blessing, in verse... 14 of Revelation 22, a similar thing is said. Blessed are they that do his commandments. Now, I know that there are other, inter there are other translations. For instance, the diaglot has washed their robes for this phrase, do his commandments. Uh, Rotherham has, who are washing their robes. But essentially, it's the same idea, isn't it? Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life. Washing robes is doing the commandments. It's keeping the garment that we were given at baptism clean. So it's essentially the same thing. But the point I want to make out of all that is simply this, that this is not and should not be, therefore, an academic study. It's not a question of saying, well, I understand the apocalypse academically. That may be helpful in some respects. But it's not what the Lord wanted us to get out of it. He wanted our lives to be affected by what we read and understood so that we are shaped and developed and prepared for his return. 
That's what he wanted. And that's what we're going to endeavour to achieve in this series. And as we go on, brethren and sisters and young people, uh, you'll have to put up with me for the first maybe three classes or so. Brother Klaus will probably do the latter portion of chapter one. But when we get to the, to the uh, chapters like two and three and six and eight and nine, where there are seven letters and seven seals and seven trumpets, we will have different brethren doing each of those letters or seals or trumpets. So we want to try and involve as many capable brethren as, as we can in this exercise uh, so that we've all got the opportunity, particularly those who are involved in speaking, of delving into this study and either confirming or growing in our, in our knowledge and appreciation of the book. You can play your part, if you're not going to be involved up here speaking, by encouraging those who will be by marking up what is uh, covered in the sessions so that we work together and grow together. And I believe that the impact of that will that we will all be affected for the good. And that can only be good, not only for us as individuals, but as an ecclesia. Now there's something else important about the apocalypse, isn't there? And it's in the fact that it separates us from other religions around us who do not believe the fundamentals of the truth. Now there's a quotation that you'll see on page B, the value of the apocalypse. It comes from Brother Thomas. It's fairly well known amongst us. It's from volume one of Eureka, page 116, where he says, they are not to be negligent hearers if they would be blessed. So this is carrying on from where we just were. They must keep or observe narrowly the things which have been written in it. They must scrutinise them and by their aid watch. Behold, I come as a thief, saith Jesus, blessed is he that watcheth. But they only can watch to any purpose who narrowly observe. The apocalypse was given to this end that the servants of the deity who are keeping their garments might be able to discern the signs of the times preceding the apocalypse of Christ and the real nature of things extant in their several generations. Now listen to this next statement. I think this is very pertinent for the times in which we live. No believer understanding this prophecy could be seduced into fellowship with the clerical institutions of the world because he would see them in all their native deformity and sin. Now it's a sad fact, but a true fact, that the longer we go on, the less that is being appreciated in some quarters. Margaret and I have a relationship, a very strong relationship with an ecclesia in New South Wales, and we go there every couple of years and spend a weekend with the brethren and sisters in that ecclesia. They have been riven in recent times over the sad issue of, we call it the spirit problem, where people have claimed that the spirit is available in some form. They don't claim that the spirit gifts are available to them. They claim that the spirit is available to them. And they don't mean the way we mean it when we say that the spirit of God is available through his word. Therefore, that's an intellectual a moral thing. They mean the spirit is active in their midst in some way. They use phrases like God is at work in this ecclesia. Well, if God is not at work in every ecclesia through his word, we're in serious trouble. But what they mean by that statement is that God is at work in some other way apart from his word. And there have been a lot of problems over this issue. This particular ecclesia had a couple, the brother was an arranging brother as well, and prominent in the meeting. He adopted some of these views and was unfortunately, sadly, had, had to be disfellowshipped. The problem was not the spirit. The problem turned out to be that he had the view, as others do, that those in the churches, 
particularly the Pentecostal type churches, the charismatic religions, who believe that the spirit is at work amongst them, could not be denied. They couldn't be denied fellowship. Maybe God was at work. So really the issue was a question of open fellowship. And people ended up going down the road and attending charismatic church services. You couldn't see anything wrong with that. And yet when you said to them, well, these people believe the Trinity, which will be the subject for next Sunday night. They believe in the immortal soul. It didn't make any difference. Because you see, the theory was that God was at work there and you can't deny that, they said. No matter about doctrine. That's why I think, brethren and sisters and young people, it's very important for us to come to grips squarely with the contents of the apocalypse. And I believe that this will be proven true. Brother Thomas says, no believer understanding this prophecy could be seduced into fellowship with the clerical institutions of the world, by which he means the churches around us. Because he would see them all in their native deformity and sin. Now that is an important aspect of our studies together. That we might see clearly where we stand in relation to others who do not understand the scriptures and who do not believe the truth. Now, we read tonight from Mark chapter 4. You might have wondered why we did that. Well, there was a reason for it. Let's come back to Mark chapter 4. A little earlier I made the comment that the apocalypse was meant to be understood. And I think all of us will be aware that when you come to the seven letters in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, every single one of them is concluded with the phrase, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the ecclesias. That's the way every single one of those letters is concluded by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said to the Ecclesiastes. Now where does he get that saying from? Well, he had used it before. And that's why we're back here in Mark chapter 4. Now we are conscious that the first eight verses of Mark chapter 4 record the first and perhaps the most important parable in the teachings of the Master. The parable of the sower. Fundamental. And yet it was not understood not even by his closest disciples. It had to be explained to them. And he did explain it to them. And he explained it to them because he wanted them to know what it meant. So we read in verse 9, he's just finished talking about the parable of the sower. And in verse 9, he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. So there are the words that are picked up and used in the Apocalypse, in Revelation 2 and 3, seven times. What does he mean by this? Well, he means that he wants them to understand what he was saying. But he knew that some to whom he spoke would not understand. Now, in verse 10, when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery or the secret of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. Why, Lord? Why do you speak in parables? Well, he quotes from Isaiah 6 in verse 12. That seeing they may see and not perceive. Oh, they'll see it written down. And hearing they may not hear, that they may hear, rather, and may not understand. They'll hear it, but they won't understand it. Lest at any time they should be converted and their sin should be forgiven them. Now, that's amazing, isn't it? When you think about it, that's amazing. He was the one that God sent to redeem mankind. 
And God would not have any man perish. But there had to be on the part of those who would come to salvation an effort to understand, a willingness to have their mind opened, a readiness to hear and to perceive. And it was not going to be for everyone. About 30 years ago, a book was issued on the apocalypse called The Apocalypse for Every Man. Which is nonsense. Because the apocalypse is not for every man. It is for the servants of God who are prepared to hear and understand and to keep the sayings of this book. And that requires a little bit of effort. And he said to them in verse 13, Know ye not this parable? And how then will ye know all parables? If you can't understand my most basic of parables, which sets out very simple principles, which are going to govern the destiny of every person who comes across my teachings, you can't understand that. How will you understand things which are deeper, and more complex. You will need to make some effort to grow, he is saying to them. And of course they had him there to help them to grow. And we, brethren and sisters and young people, have brethren who have gone before who can help us to grow an understanding of the apocalypse. And at the head of those is our beloved brother Thomas, who wrote Eureka. And it's absolutely amazing, that book, when you consider the amount of help that he had in order to understand it. He wasn't without help. There had been much written on the apocalypse before him that was in part correct. He just sorted it out and developed it. We can be very thankful to our God that we have such brethren like that and living brethren today who can assist us to understand. But it does require effort on our part because the apocalypse like these parables, was not for every man. It is to those who are classed the servants of God, who have an ear to hear. Now what that also implies, doesn't it, is that there can only be one correct interpretation of the apocalypse. If it is to be understood, then you can't have a multitude of interpretations. There is only one correct interpretation. And yet today it's a sad fact that in our brotherhood there are many p particular interpretations, if not about the whole book, and there are a number of those, certainly about portions of it. And little bits are taken here and there and used for purposes that were never the intent. It's very important for us, therefore, to have the framework of this book fixed in our mind to see where it was going and to make sure that our interpretation of it fits with that overall framework. Now, boiled down to its basic elements, there are three basic interpretations of the apocalypse. There is what is called the preterist view, that is, a view that the apocalypse has all been fulfilled in the past, particularly surrounding the events of AD 70, which I find quite strange because... At the very best estimate, the Apocalypse was given to John around about AD 96 when he was exiled in Patmos. How the book could have referred to AD 70, I don't know, seeing that it was a prophecy. But that's the view that has been put forward um, by some in the past, that it's all to do with events surrounding AD 70 in the first century. Therefore, it's all past and has no real value to those of us who live here today, except that we might be able to look back and say, well, the prophecy was fulfilled. There's the other view that it's all in the future. And there's a lot of this going on around. There's people making millions of dollars out of the misinterpretation of the apocalypse today, making films and writing books about elements of the apocalypse, and it's all up there in the future, the whole thing virtually. Some mysterious future. That's the futurist view. And the third view is the correct one, and that is the continuous historical interpretation. And we know that when you read, and Brother Neville again emphasised this, in chapter 1 of Revelation, you read these words. 
At the end of verse 1 it says, <clears throat> To show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Now to shortly come to pass means that it was going to come to pass not long after John. Now John lived towards the end of the first century. So the futurist view can't be right. Now that's the most prominent view apart from the continuous historical interpretation, the futurist idea. It simply can't be right because that was 19 centuries ago. So we make the point again. There can only be one correct interpretation of the apocalypse. Now I'm not suggesting therefore that there's not little minor points here and there where people may differ. We're not talking about that. We are talking about the overall interpretation, the framework of the book and the unfolding of history continuously down from the time of John to our own day and beyond to the establishment of the kingdom of God and even beyond that into the time when God will be all and in all. You can only have one interpretation. Now I want to quote some words from Brother Roberts. Now these words appear or seem to be when you first, when you first look at them they seem to be a little harsh. But he gave these in a, in a lecture. The book actually is called 13 Lectures on the Apocalypse. And the point he makes, I think, is important for those of us who feel a little bit inadequate and maybe we think, well, I've, you know, I've read bits of this and I don't really know what it's talking about. He gives some encouragement to us and we've used this with our young people a little bit earlier in the year, so I apologise to them for that fact, but I, I think it's important that we... We just consider these words of Brother Roberts. He says, Only after patient study of the book of God for a long time, the excellence of the apocalypse is appreciated. For a time, the matter of the apocalypse seems wild, austere, high, hard, perhaps inscrutable. Something unpractical, something not useful. Such impressions are due to spiritual infancy. Men ought to condemn themselves for such feelings. They ought to be very modest. They ought to assume, even if not able to perceive, that the apocalypse must be wise and useful because an emanation of the divine mind. We must not set ourselves up as the standard of judgment. We are all fools to start with, if not to finish with. The first step in true progress is to know that we are ignorant, there is hope when we realise this. Now I can think back when I was a teenager and just beginning to emerge into studying the Bible. And you know, the book I wanted to study most of all was the Apocalypse because it meant nothing to me virtually. But of course I'd started at the wrong end. My interest in the Apocalypse was good I think but I just didn't have the background for it. I didn't know much about Genesis, didn't know much about Daniel. And Daniel is very important to the understanding of the Apocalypse. So what we're going to be doing in this series is when we, when we do come across symbols that are used in the Apocalypse that have their roots in the Old Testament, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about that so that we can develop our understanding of those things as well. Now we are very fortunate in this ecclesia that over the years we have circulated uh, material on Daniel and the apocalypse and events subsequent and things like that and there is I think an, an appreciation here which gives us a very firm and sound basis upon which to build but we're not going to assume that everybody has that as firm as it ought to be but as Brother Robert says if you feel as though this is a, a bit of a con an conundrum, a, a difficulty for for you at the moment, if you take the approach that that is a platform from which you can build and you're humble about that, then you will grow.
we realise this. Now, I just want to, having referred to Daniel as being important, I just want to emphasise one point about Daniel and the Apocalypse, or a couple of points about it. Again, you will have some notes on this. You see, there are people who have interpreted the Apocalypse as having relevance to all sorts of things, to Israel and to other things, and will not accept the interpretation that Daniel provides the roots for the Apocalypse and that the Apocalypse is expanding upon what Daniel has said about the development of the Roman Empire and its systems, in particular its religion, the Roman Catholic system. For whatever reason, they want to avoid that interpretation. Well, we just need to cement the fact that the Apocalypse is not really new. It might say a lot of things about the development of the Roman Catholic system that Daniel doesn't say, but it doesn't say anything about the foundations of that subject that Daniel hasn't already said. And it's very important for us to see the flow of thought that runs through from particularly the book of Daniel into the Apocalypse. So, as you can see from that transparency, Daniel records the continuous existence of the Roman power from Christ's first advent to his second. Its change of religion, blasphemy, and opposition to God and his people. And you can have a look. Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8, Daniel chapter 11. All of those things are found in those chapters. The fact that Daniel was given by God this prophecy concerning the development of a great fourth beast power which would be a religion in its end that would be in opposition to God and his religion and would persecute his saints and would be there to be destroyed by the Lord Jesus Christ at the end of the days. Now, there's no doubt that that's what Daniel is saying in a nutshell. And that's all the Apocalypse does. It develops that theme. That's why you see when the Apostle Paul comes to speak of this, we might just turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he refers to this same power. In the 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he says in verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day that is, the coming of the Lord shall not come, except there be a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition or destruction, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, all that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So here he's talking about the development of a system which in fact was to be developed out of the true ecclesia it was a religious system which would so exalt itself in the earth that it would claim to be in God's stead. And the Pope, of course, in due time became, as the Apocalypse describes him, the God of the earth and sat in the Vatican which he and his people regarded as the temple of God on earth. Now the Apostle Paul is talking about the development of this system out of the ecclesia because he says in verse 7, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Where was it working? Well, it was working in the brotherhood. Only he who now letteth or restraineth, and he's talking here about the pagan Roman power which resisted the growth of Christianity in its apostate form, as well as in its truth form. He that now letteth or restraineth will restrain until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now this lines up with Daniel, doesn't it? That a religious system would grow out of that fourth beast power, the Roman power, and it would oppose the truth and would ultimately be destroyed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Would be destroyed with the brightness of his coming. Perfectly consistent with the teaching of Daniel. So when you come to the Apocalypse, 
In chapters 2 and 3, Christ warns the Gentile ecclesias of Asia of the existence of certain people who were in their midst in the main. There were Nicolaitans. Now, we'll talk more about them in due time, God willing. There was the synagogue of Satan. There was the Balaamites. And perhaps most ominously of all, there was that woman, Jezebel. And that woman, Jezebel, of course, later on became the harlot system of Rome. It developed out of the ranks of the ecclesia by the corruption of the truth. Slowly but surely over a long period of time. And that corruption was allowed to happen. That's why Christ wrote to those ecclesias. He warned them about what was going on in their midst. Apparently, they did nothing about it. They just let it happen. And it did happen over time. And there was an apostasy. So that's consistent too, isn't it, with Daniel. And then when you come to Revelation chapter 17 and other parts of the apocalypse, you have that woman system described. Now, Revelation 17, we've done recently in our study classes, but we'll just have a quick look here at the description of this woman. This Jezebel that was in Thyatira, by Revelation 17, which of course is talking about the, the system as it exists today or will exist tomorrow and which will oppose Christ, this system is described in verse 3, he says, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet coloured beast full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet colour and decked with colours with gold and precious stones and pearls having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication and upon her forehead was a name written and here's the clue mystery Babylon the great the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth and this woman was drunk with the blood of the saints and of the witnesses of Jesus. So it's the same system that Paul warned about. It's the system that Daniel warned about. Now, why people insist on finding some other focus for this prophecy, I don't understand. But you will read books where it talks about this woman being Israel and all that sort of stuff. Well... It's quite clear that there is a pattern here which starts back, if not in Daniel, it certainly starts in the, in the Old Testament, maybe, of course, earlier than Daniel, and comes right through to the Apocalypse. Now, that's, I didn't want to get into too much complication there, but that's a, hopefully a simple summary of the way in which Daniel and the Apocalypse flow together. Now finally, before I finish tonight, I want to direct your attention, if I can, to the second uh, leaf in this folder. We'll come to the chart on the Kingdom of Men next time, God willing, but the second leaf in the folder is about the breaking up chapter divisions of the Apocalypse. It's entitled The Apocalypse Epitomised, The Unveiling of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now what this does is obvious, of course, is it goes through each chapter, each section of the book, breaks it up into its subject material. Now for those of you who are keen to make a start, if you haven't done any marking in the apocalypse at all, or have not done extensive marking, you might want to begin the process of doing your chapter breakups. Now when we do Bible marking, that's something that I think should come basically first. You decide what is in a section and summarise it. Now we've suggested what can be uh, placed in your margin in terms of breaking up the chapters. So that, for instance, in chapter 1, verses 1 to 3 is the prologue, it's the title introduction to the book, verses 4 to 6, the salutation to the seven ecclesias, and verse 7, Christ coming with clouds, and so on. And once you've got those chapter divisions in your Bible, then it's a reasonably simple matter when you get the verse-by-verse -verse notes to mark in the content between those chapter divisions. Now what you're going to find is that when you get the notes, <coughs> they have been taken largely from Brother Mansfield's Apocalypse Epitomised. And they are epitomised in the sense that I'm only going to be giving to you notes that are in the margin of my Bible because that's all I could get into my margin. Now you may be able to write smaller than me, 
But that's all I could get in my margin. And so, as you know with Bible marking, you have to actually think about distilling down what is written into something that makes sense to you so that you can use it for all time. Now, I've tried hard to do that, not just for myself but for others, but it may not be perfect. I'm sure it's not perfect. So you will have to do your own work when you come to do your Bible marking. But at the very least, young people in particular, at the very least, if you do your chapter divisions, you will have a lot better idea about this book once you've completed that process than when you began. So that's our first session on the unveiling of the Lord Jesus Christ, the understanding of the apocalypse. Next time, God willing, we'll talk about the structure of the book and we'll look at the, uh, the chart on the kingdom of men and hopefully make our way into chapter one.